Titus chapter 2, if you would. I'm going to uh, talk this morning and kind of get a break from 1 Corinthians for one Sunday and kind of just see what God's Word has to say about wholesome teaching to women. And uh, I know usually I get really nervous when it comes Mother's Day because I want to be very careful and very uh, loving and compassionate towards moms because they have a great, great chore. And uh, I don't know about you, but I appreciate my mother and all that she went through and all that I put her through and she still lived to tell about it and uh, I appreciate appreciate her very much and all that she did and all that she sacrificed and all the love that she gave to me. So I hope that you will think about this message in light of that and realize this is God's word. What does God have to say about moms and what does God have to say to mothers specifically? But you know what also it applies to others as well some of this teaching in Titus Titus chapter 2, but I want to invite you to turn Titus chapter 2, and we'll begin reading in verse 3, kind of just right in the middle of the dialogue as Paul is writing to the pastor there on the island of Crete. He says, Titus, these are some things to remember, these are some things to consider, but most importantly, transfer this teaching to those that are the older women. Sometimes we kind of forget what a great, great ministry Ladies that are godly and older and are wise can give to those that are younger. But let's look there and read Titus chapter 2. Verse 3 says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior. And he uses that word likewise because he's just been talking to the men. Older men, younger men, and saying, Now I'm going to address the men. So, by the way, he's not just picking on women. He's also talking to men as well. And he says... We are there to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. Verse 4 says, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. There was a guy named Robert Ingersoll, and he was a skeptic of days gone by, basically, and there were some students that were going to listen to this famed Robert Ingersoll and hear his lecture, hear what he had to say. What's he going to say this afternoon on college campus? Well, little by little, he just kind of went on and on, and finally the two students started walking down the street after he was done, and they were talking back and forth, and one of them said to the other, well, I guess he knocked the props out from under Christianity, didn't he? The other one kind of just stopped for a minute. He said, no, I don't think that he did. Ingersoll didn't explain my mother's life, and until he can explain my mother's life, I will stand by my mother's God. Well, that's exactly what I believe Titus and Paul and God's Word is getting at. It's behavior. It's what does moms need to do? What do they need to live like? How do they need to react and respond and live before their families, most importantly? Because sometimes I really think we've forgotten about the real mission field. It's at home. If we lose our families, we've lost everything. If our boys and our girls, they go out and they live like the world and they do not serve Jesus Christ, then what are we doing here? We need to really be an example, Christian example, before our children. So teaching should be given to what? Encourage others, namely moms and namely women. And so he says in verse 3, he says, number one, Paul addressing Titus, then saying transfer this also to your ladies, They should have healthy behavior. Let's read it once more. Verse 3, older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior. Now, how old are these women? I'm going to get real in real big trouble here. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say specifically. It could be 60 and older, but really it's generic. It's a generic term. And it's saying those that are older just get someone that's younger and teach and train them. In other words, if someone is 40... Find someone that's 30 or 25 and pour your lives into them. Is there someone that you're investing in? You know, sometimes God has really convicted me of not doing enough of that. Not pouring my life into someone else. I'll get busy with my agenda. And God says, what about other people? The Great Commission is what? About discipling and pouring your life into other people. And that's very, very important. Well, here he addresses specifically older ladies to younger ladies. What does the word reverent literally mean? It's used here only in Scripture. 
has the idea of priestess or priest-like. In other words, they're saying this is sacred duty. This is important. This is essential. If the church is going to be solid, spiritually speaking, then we have to pour our lives into other people trying to what? See them bear spiritual fruit. So what are you talking about? I'm talking about cherries hanging from their ears, bananas from their nose. What are you talking about? What are you talking about spiritual fruit? What's it mean by fruit? It means evidence that the Holy Spirit of God is working in their life. Love, joy, peace, self-control, patience. I don't like that one. But on and on and on, there's very different ones that ought to be evident that God is working in their life or working in my life. Spiritual fruit or spiritual evidence. Reverence. Reverence or reverence is the word used there. Fitting or suitable is also what it means. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. And by the way, don't turn me off after you hear this verse. This is a tough verse to swallow. And by the way, I don't think it just applies to women. I think specifically he addresses women because he's talking about a church here, Timothy being pastor of Ephesus. But this is what he says in verse 9. Women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire. So you're saying that women can't wear gold. No. No, because if that's the case, then you can't wear a wedding ring, right? Isn't that right? Uh, mine's zirconium, but you know what? Yours may be gold, right? No, really, my wife gave me a gold ring, I promise. You know what? We, that's not what he's saying. His point is that you ought not to be going to church to what? Draw attraction to yourself or attention to yourself. In other words, the issue in Ephesus was this. They were going to church, and it was drawing attention away from worship of God because they were very much into the dressing very, very nice. Nothing wrong with dressing nice, by the way. But if that's all you're about and there's nothing on the inside, then what good is it? God isn't just about the exterior, is he? He's also about the interior. And sometimes we paint it up and we look good on the outside and God says, how about the inside? How about spreading mercy and love and grace on the inside as well? And by the way, it is the guys as well. Guys, if we're a bunch of showy people and we have no character, we have no godliness, we have nothing that is anything like Jesus Christ, then again, we're kind of just spinning our wheels, spiritually speaking. Notice what he says in verse 3 as well again, going back to Titus chapter 2. Reverent in behavior, or healthy we might say, or suitable or profitable in behavior, but negatively not slanderers or slaves to much wine. And by the way, let me just stop for just a minute here. I know some of you ladies, maybe Mother's Day is not a great day. It's kind of a tough day. Maybe you didn't have a good relationship with your mother. Maybe you didn't have a good relationship with your daughter. I don't know. I know this, that from this day forward, as we surrender to God, we can make things what they need to be through his power, through his grace, and through his mercy. But he says, don't be slanders. Literally, it can be translated malicious gossips. By the way, I'm using that word again because I want to do this as a side note. Guys can gossip too, right, ladies? That's right. So sometimes the ladies get a bad rap for the tongue, but I've been around some, I'm just attack us, preachers. Sometimes preachers are the worst at slandering other preachers. Just to be very honest with you, very blatant. If they don't do exactly the way things ought to be done, the way they think they ought to be done, then they start gossiping about somebody else. So it's guys and girls both, ladies and men both. It is a problem. Literally, the Greek word is diabolos. It's used 34 times in the New Testament. It's used many, many times for the devil. Ugh. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. That's a tough one. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. The devil is very, very malicious at what? Trying to bring up the past about Christians. I think it was Carmen that said, you know what? When the devil brings up your past, just let him know about his future. I like that. Let him know about what's happening. God is still on his throne, and Christ is still the conqueror. And we can still trust in him and lean on him. The word slander literally means also to throw between. To throw between. 
Think about going back to Genesis chapter 3. Satan did what? He threw lies between God and Eve. Did God really say that? Are you really going to die if you eat or partake of that fruit? He's always trying to question God's authority and God's word, isn't he? That's literally slander. That's what it means. Before we leave that, let's just ask this question for all of us. Is there something we're throwing between one person and another person? Rumors, gossip, lies, exaggeration, whatever you want to throw in there that is wrecking and wreaking havoc in those relationships? I wonder how many families have been ruined and wrecked because of the tongue. I wonder how many churches have split because of the tongue. I wonder how much problems have been caused at work or in the neighborhood because of gossip. Gossip is a really terrible, evil poison. You say, I thought Mother's Day was supposed to be encouraging for moms. It is. It's getting there. Just hang on. <laughs> One billboard capture, captures this. He who throws dirt loses ground. That's a good thought. He who throws dirt loses ground. Boy, I've been burnt by that one many times. I'll throw and slam dirt because I was jealous of somebody. And God says, wait a minute. Why are you saying that? Is that even true? Do you know it's true? Is it secondhand information? Can you go up to that person that said that and say, can I quote you? I'm writing an article. God convicted me heavily many, many times and still does about that issue. Slander is a big deal. Healthy behavior includes healthy lips. Healthy behavior includes healthy lips. Okay, now you can take a breath for a minute. Here's some traditional wisdom that maybe will encourage you just a little bit talks about speech and tongue one person said it this way it would be better to leave people wondering why you didn't talk than why you did first law and you could say amen to this one first law of public speaking is nice guys finish fast amen amen come on amen, amen. i got thick skin come on guys all right when all is said and done, there's a lot more said than done, one person said. And I don't really like this one, but it's a good reminder for me. It's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> Amen, or many times I have to say, oh me. Paul says it this way, going on to verse 4. Paul says, Women should give healthy training. Look again, if you would, at verse 4. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children. Why? So they can be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. So if the word of God and the work of God can go forward and make progress and benefit other people, and why are we here anyway? To be a blessing to others. We're not here to hoard everything up for ourselves. We're here to be a blessing to other people and to help them and be there for them. What does the idea of train literally mean? It literally means to encourage or come alongside of. Older women to younger women, encourage them. Come alongside of them. Help them. Do you got someone that is that kind of person in your life? There may be, they've been a Christian longer than you. They may be older than you. They may be just someone that they have raised kids and they may be a grandma's now. They can be a real benefit to you as younger ladies. I'd encourage you that are younger ladies to really latch on to them, learn from them. There's some guys that I really can learn from that are older than me and a whole lot wiser than I am. There's so much more that I can learn, and I can learn it from God's people that are a lot older and wiser than me. Literally, the idea there of training or teaching there literally has the idea of that women, young women, may be sober-minded so that they're not foolish, so that they're not what? Going after things that are a distraction from their walk with Jesus Christ. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way that he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. That word train, you say, well, why does that have anything to do with women? Well, simply this. If I'm going to train those that are in my home, that are kids in my home, then I'm going to have to have some training from somebody else. How many of you had a training manual about raising kids given to you when you were about 25? Anybody? 
I didn't. There wasn't one that I knew of. There was some good advice that I could have got that I probably didn't take advantage of from other wiser, older people. And so I need that training, that coming alongside of by other people, that encouragement. Hey, don't give up. Those kids aren't done yet. <laughs> hey, I know. I know you see the broken windows. Yeah, but those kids aren't done yet. Hey, I know you see all the dirty dishes. Yeah, but those kids, God's not done with them yet. You see the tough time in school that they have. Yes, but God's not done with you yet and not done with them yet. Train them up. There was a French naturalist. His name was John Henry Fabry. And he conducted an experiment with, of all things, caterpillars. He noticed that caterpillars would follow naturally each other. And they would go around in circles many times. So he put a, a bunch of caterpillars on this flower pot and watched them as the leader went around and all these other fuzzy little caterpillars were following them one after another after another. And then he placed pine needles, some of the caterpillars' most favorite food, right in the middle of that flower pot. But not once did any of the caterpillars stop and go and get some food. They kept following the leader around, 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 and around. Little by little, the fuzzy little creatures fell over in starvation. So that's nice. What's your point about caterpillars versus moms? Simply this. Many times, James Dobson and his wife Shirley Dobson mentioned this, that we're like those caterpillars. We're so busy and so overcommitted that we don't have time to invest in the people in our own home. This is what he says. He says, Moms trudge around in circles from morning till night, wondering how are they going to get everything done. Moms, you ever feel that way? How am I going to get everything done? Many moms work full-time jobs, and then they got to come home to do what? Take care of the family, right? How about this? Let me just mention a few things. Chauffeuring kids, right? Taxi service, Sabiri, right? You're it. You've been nominated, right? Fixing meals, you know they call them soccer moms for a reason, right? Right? Just act like you know what I'm talking about. Okay, all right. <laughs> Fixing meals, cleaning house, trying to maintain marriage. Boy, that's a, a big time, that's a full time job, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, you better believe it. How about this, most importantly, spiritual obligations. Most importantly, feeding your soul. Reading God's word, praying, spending time with Jesus Christ. Submitting to the Holy Spirit as he leads us and directs us and guides us in the truth of Scripture. There's so many things to do. James Dobson says it's a breathless way of life we call, quote, routine panic. Mm. The tendency for families, he says, is to take on too many commitments. And it's rampant these days, but it can be avoided by employing one little word. No. No. Isn't it hard to say sometimes? I know I just can't. My plate's full. Monday through Friday, the schedule's full, and then some, and then some. I can't take on anything else. Sometimes we need to say yes to the best and no to the good. That's tough. That takes a lot of wisdom. Yes to the best, no to the good. That's tough to do, isn't it, moms, specifically? you got a tough job. But thankfully, God has some solutions. God has some solutions. Titus chapter 2, verse 12, going on further in that same chapter. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. I think the NIV says it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. What does upright mean? Literally, integrity. Integrity. If you say something, you're going to come through and you're going to do it. Um, sometimes we can say we're going to do three things and we have time for two things. You know what? That third thing, sorry, I've got to say no to it. Just can't do it. Further on, to illustrate the point, 1 Timothy 4, 7 says, Train yourself for godliness. The following verse says it this way. I think it's on the, on the screen here. Look at verse 8. Have nothing to do with godless myths. And then verse 8, that's right, go to... For physical training is of some value. By the way, sometimes we as Christians that are not in shape, if you will, like to use this verse and say, see, God's word says don't exercise. That's not what it says. 
It does not say forsake the YMCA. It doesn't say that. doesn't say that. doesn't say that. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for what? All things. Physical exercise is good, yes, but it's not near as good as what? Godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. That word train or trained also in other places in Scripture, Genesis 14, 14, talks about drilled or ready or prepared for war. Abraham used that terminology talking about the servants coming up in his household. They were trill, drilled and trained and ready to go and prepared. So he says, why do we need this godly or healthy training? Well, let's close it up this morning by looking again at Titus chapter 2, verse 4. Train them to what? The last part of verse 4 says, to love their husbands and their children. That's the summation. To love their husbands and their children. You say, I don't even like my husband right now. <laughs> Let's just be real. We're in church. No problem being honest. God knows our hearts anyway. I don't even like my husband right now. He's aggravating to me. Well, the word is continually fond of their husbands. In other words, older ladies, please, we want to encourage you as younger ladies to learn and be trained to love your husbands. It doesn't happen today, does it? Feelings come and feelings go, but we're talking about a commitment. A commitment. Young wives need to be trained to love their husbands. The idea, let, let's just go with what it's not as we close this morning. This is what loving your husbands is not. I'll love you if you rub my back. It's not it, sorry. By the way, should guys, as husbands, rub their wife's back? Oh, come on now. I know you, I know you agree with that. Come on, what now? Yes. <laughs> it wasn't exactly for guys, but okay. The idea is not this. I'll love you if you let me watch the Hallmark Marathon. That's not it either. Now, ladies, should guys, don't answer this, guys. Should guys let you watch Hallmark? Those that like it. I think it's like going to the dentist, personally, but anyway. <laughs> All right. Yes, we should what? Sacrifice. We should do that for our wives every once in a while. <laughs> it's not this. I'll love you if you tell me what I'm thinking. I've heard, I've heard my wife say, if I tell you, I'm just not going to tell you. I don't know. I, don't, I can't read your mind. You know what? We have to listen and learn, don't we, as guys. I like what Brian Bill says in Mentoring Women. He says, too many today get married because they have romantic feelings, and when the feelings go away, they want to go away. Good quote. The feelings are going to go away sooner or later, right? Amen, wives? Amen, guys? You better believe it. The feelings are not always there. Notice what else he says. He says, biblical love, I like this definition, biblical love is an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person. Two imperfect people that are trying to make a marriage go. It's tough. Knowing how to fight well, right? And godly. I know none of you ever fight, right? I had somebody in our church one time tell me that they had never fought. I didn't, I wasn't believing it, but anyway. <laughs> there's a lot of things in here but let me close down notice what else it says not only love your husbands but also love your children it doesn't mean giving them everything they want I know I'm, I'm, I'm there's a long list here the scripture has a lot but if you can just tie into one and apply just one it requires discipline you're going to love your children that's not a word that we hear a lot on the internet, is it? We don't hear that on the 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock news, do we? Discipline. That's a good word. That's a good word. 
Proverbs 20, and by the way, that doesn't equal abuse. Discipline does not equal abuse. My parents spanked my behind, the padded part of me, and I was never abused. Not once, not once. I didn't appreciate it then, but I love them now for what they did. Spanking me. By the way, the Bible teaches that. Proverbs 23, verse 13 and 14. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish him with the rod, he will not die. Punish him with the rod and save his soul from death. He said, man, all you young people are like, a rod? That sounds vicious. Man, what are you talking, a rake? Or what are you talking about? A shovel? What is he referring to when he talks about a rod? (laughs) <laughs> not beating, not beating. A rod is probably the size of a what? Ping pong paddle. Or 97 cent spoon from Walmart. God gave them cushion back here for a reason. To show them that you love them. That's right. Boundaries. Guys, there's a lot of stuff here. Let me just close with, th- with this thought. Rufus Jones told a story as we get ready to pray in a few moments about his childhood. Brother Rufus Jones, when he was 12 years old, said, you know, my mom said, okay, you got so many chores to do, and I'll be back in a few minutes, or actually later on. Time went on, and he said, I'm going to get my chores done. But he got busy, like many kids do, playing ball with the fellow boys, you know, fellow neighborhood boys. They're playing ball, and they're having a good time. He forgot all about the chores, and all of a sudden, the afternoon passes, it gets to early evening, mom pulls up in the driveway, and his heart sank. He knew he was getting ready to get a whipping or a spanking, whatever you want to call it. Mom got out of the driveway, got out of the car, started to go up the stairs and said, come here, and asked Rufus to come and follow her, looked him straight in the eye, and tears started to come down Rufus Jones' mom's face. And then she started to pray one phrase at a time. Lord, make a man out of him. Lord, make a man out of him. And he still, after many, many years, remembered that story from his childhood. And he said, I'm thankful that my mom prayed for me to become a man, a godly man. What happens if we do not address our homes? specifically moms I just want to say real quickly I appreciate you I know you probably don't think that after this sermon there's a lot in here and it's not to say I got this all down and those qualities I fall short many many times but I just want to encourage you there's some things that can make your home better and if I can just encourage you to do one thing to make it better I want to do that why because the alternative is what More violence, more shooting in schools, more teen pregnancy, more whatever. And on and on and on, you can see all the problems. What did we see when God was taken out? No prayer in schools. And what's happened now, we're seeing what's happening now. And so I want a better solution. How about you? Maybe today you just want to come and grab another lady and grab your daughter and come and pray. I want to encourage you to do that. Mothers, by the way, we love you appreciate you and thank you for all that you do in your home in the church in your community at work everything that you do i couldn't do it all so thank you for what you do let's stay in our feet and go lord in a word of prayer